Good morning, everybody. I'll just give everybody a few minutes for their audio to connect. Let's check if we've got a few more people coming into the waiting room. How is everybody this morning? Very good. Good. Very good. Hi, Chris. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Right. So welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to our Sporting Heritage Memories Manual session. Um, you're the very privileged few to get this first, this first sneak peek at Hugh and Michael's work. For those of you who I haven't met before, my name's Fran Stobbard and I'm the Workforce Development Lead for Sporting Heritage. So I'm going to sit and do the topping and tailing of today's session and I'm going to hand over to Hugh and Michael in a moment who will lead the main part. Um, they're going to deliver a presentation and there'll be a Q&A session at the end. If you'd like to ask questions as we go through, please can you put them in the chat and we'll pick them up um, from there. Or if we don't manage to pick them up in the main part of the presentation, we'll pick them up in the Q&A at the end. Um, right, I think that's all I needed to say. So Hugh, we're over to you. Thank you very much, Fran. Good morning, everybody. And uh, we'll uh, go for the technology here, make sure that we're all linking up together. That should take you to the opening page of the presentation. So just a, a few brief words before I um, hand over to my co-conspirator, uh, Michael. We've been uh, tasked with producing a handbook which would be useful to uh, sporting memories groups and sporting heritage, the application of, of sporting heritage to memories and reminiscence work throughout the UK and the Four Nations. So just as a caveat before I start, uh, there are a couple of things to say. One, um, we're at a kind, almost at a final draft stage where we're uh, submitting the, the actual document in its current form to one or two key individuals who are expert in certain areas of the work uh, for, for comment and for addition. And, and this today is very much uh, an offer to yourselves to identify any gaps in what we're saying or to make suggestions which could still be incorporated at this stage. So our next week uh, would be a kind of final week of redrafting or restructuring or anything like that that needs to be done. And the final document will be produced in um, a PDF format, uh, which will be user friendly. It's not in any way an academic treatise on the causes of dementia or a cure for dementia or anything like that. It's very designed to be very practical uh, and very user friendly. I'd also say that some people will be very familiar with some parts of the content. Um, it's primarily aimed, uh, we would suggest, that people who are starting out or less experienced in the practices, the working practices and the formalities. I'd also say that because we're, we're having um, this kind of four nations approach, there will be some nuances and um, differences in terms of application or even a legislation um, or delivery of services, particularly in the care home sector where uh, the different nations will have different um, sets of rules, if you want, in terms of how uh, access to care homes and, and provision is, is, is made. So these, these things will apply. So um, the document is designed to be flexible uh, and user friendly. So just to... Uh, Seem to have leapt forward there to a couple of uh, um, different slides, but we've carved the, the document up into two separate um, parts. And um, the, the first one is partly historical, but partly background and, and it identifies a number of key areas um, which are important when, set, when people are setting up groups or the answer uh, questions that people might have. And one of the key um, elements or the key influences in what we were doing is if Michael and I had been writing this handbook 12 months ago, even 12 months ago in the early stages of COVID, it would have been very different, I suspect, to what it is now because our lives have changed and our delivery uh, of the reminiscence effort has changed. Um, we're drawing on our own experiences a lot of the time, Michael is more experienced in a wider range of groups than I am, but my main experience is drawn from a Shinty memories background uh, and specifically um, um, a project we have in, in Badenoch in the Highlands, um, which has been very successful and continues to develop. But we've had there, for example, to translate all our work 
from um, social uh, settings or individual settings with care homes and um, people who are living alone to a 100% online delivery. And that had to happen virtually overnight. So there's an element of the, of the delivery in this manual, uh, which will, um, sorry, the slides seem to be jumping ahead in the road, but we'll jog them back and forth as, as necessary. So if we go back to this one, the, the first contents are, as I say, very general and will they're seen as an introductory um, phase in terms of setting up and developing provision in any particular area and any particular sport. So where you see references to an individual sport in the document, you can effectively substitute your own sport for that because the application of the principles should be very, very straightforward. So what applies in Shinti uh, will apply largely in golf, for example, because they're very similar sports, but there may be some tweaking to be done between the sports. So I'm going to hand over to Michael now to take us through uh, the first section, if you want, um, of the document. So over to you, Michael. Uh, thank you, Hugh, Dan. The not so long ago, uh, reminiscence and looking back was kind of frowned upon with older people who had memory problems. And there was a huge change around about 1970 and they realized then that the power of reminiscence was quite uh, amazing. And people were concentrating um, on growing older and, and the effects of aging. And they began to see that reminiscent oral history was, was really an important thing. And above all, it was actually enjoyable. And you maybe wonder what this picture is up here. This was a picture of the National Football Stadium in Glasgow and a lady who was a quilter decided that she would ask groups all over the world to produce a quilt about memories and the impact of memories on dementia. And once the exhibition was over, the quilts were all sold off and raised money for football memories. And some of them were really quite moving and, and very, very impressive. So there's a link between heritage and memories and older people can provide a tremendous fount of knowledge and experience in, in sports. And they have stories that none of the uh, textbooks ever had, okay? I'll just show you these, Michael. They were, um, you, you can talk us through these, but the, they, they should have come up first for some reason of jump, but they, they're indicative of the impact of what you're uh, talking about there. Yeah, I'll let you read them for yourself. They're all absolutely but, genuine. And yeah, it, the, these are examples of the reaction we've had from various groups in various areas, and they come from all sorts of places like care homes or individuals or family memories, and, and they, they are in essence, reaction to what Michael was saying. And the, the, the top one there, we'll come back to that in a section I'm referring to, is a recent experience we had of somebody in a care home, um, a pa um, patient in a care home who was living with dementia for years and hadn't spoken, hadn't made any communication for years. And when we introduced that individual to a shinty stick and a ball, the reaction is there. This is what happened. Um, as a preamble to actually taking part in some physical activity. And that was the reaction we got. So these testimonials are very important. They're not in any sense uh, an academic evaluation of what we're doing, but they do indicate, and I'll come back to that particular case later on. Okay. So why, why sport then? <clears throat> and I think apart from possibly music, sport is one of the most powerful triggers that you can have with people who are living with dementia and memory problems. And lots of the groups that have been set up have gone for the kind of group identity and they've devised um, polo shirts or sweatshirts with the appropriate logo of the sport on it, with the idea of kind of recreating match day. And lots of people are very keen um, to get their, their, their gear on on a match day and family members or carers can, can, can produce that. So it gives them a day as a fixed day. All, all the groups meet on a fixed time and a fixed day so that there is a routine there. And family members are welcome to come along to groups and help as, as triggers. 
But what you have to watch is that the family member or the carer does, doesn't take over and, and dive in with the kind of answers to the, the visual triggers. And it, it creates the team spirit and people feel that they're back with the like-minded people. And that, that's a very important part of linking sport and memories, okay? Before COVID then we were doing really well. And as Hugh Dan said, there's lots of face-to-face -face meetings and there was a massive potential. More and more sports were starting to, to get involved. And there was generous um, uptake from professional sports clubs, but also from amateur sports clubs. And the most exciting thing of all was that they were starting to link the reminiscence with activity and we'll maybe talk about that later on, uh, partly because funding was for activity rather than reminiscence, but also when people were talking about the games, you could see them getting into a kind of motor memory and, and wanting to hold clubs. Um, and this old chap here, I, I just couldn't believe this. If I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, he was 96. He was a former uh, Spitfire pilot during the war, and he had, uh, he had a carer who had to support him. He could barely walk. But when he got down to this piece of ground um, and he got the golf club in his hand, the change in his physical stance uh, was unbelievable. And he hit the ball much further than, than I could. So before COVID, things were looking really good for a big expansion of um, sporting reminiscence, okay? So at the time of the first lockdown, we had coverage in all of these sports and the ones that were really creating a great deal of interest uh, throughout the country. And the picture there is, is quite a moving one, is of a guy who was a Scottish international rugby player and that's him coming to a memory say rugby memory session with his daughter and he absolutely lit up and he was quite in advanced stages of dementia and once he was in the clubhouse and he could see the jerseys and the pictures he, he just was back to uh, as he was for for a brief spell okay so what what had we learned in in that first period we've been I, i've been doing this kind of thing since about 2004 and as a national project in football since uh, 2009. And we learned that people who are struggling with memory problems, and Kenny, you, Kenny's listening in, he's, he's a professional in this field, um, still images are still the most effective. Sometimes in groups, people want to show 90 minutes or 80 minutes of, of a game and I, I think that's maybe stretching it a wee bit too far for concentration span. So the still image in your hand, as long as the person needs to look at it and providing little clues and things is, is perfectly acceptable. The danger that some of the early volunteers had was that it was becoming a kind of quiz. And sometimes they said things that made you cringe where somebody would show a picture and then the volunteer had said something like, oh, you must remember that. And of course the poor guy couldn't remember it. But talking about sport is a great trigger because not only are you talking about games and matches and sometimes even scores, but you're talking about who you went with, um, how you got there, was it in a bus, a train, where were the stations, who, and then it links into life events like boyfriends, girlfriends, going with your son for the first time. And one of the most moving things I, I heard in that link in the life story was a guy who was talking about going to a game with his dad and he didn't realize obviously that that was the last time he would be doing that. So it's, it's quite emotional and it's always a good idea to have a, a box of tissues at the ready. And sometimes the people in the groups are worried that they're going to fail or they're not going to know things. And that doesn't matter. None doesn't matter in the slightest. So setting the mood and the tone is brilliant. 
And I know that a lot of you already do this, that when they come in uh, to have football or rugby or cricket, whatever it is, memorabilia is a great setting. And we are amateur enthusiasts for our sport. And it's crucial that you have some kind of link to a professional who's involved in the world of uh, dementia or Alzheimer's. And between the two of you, you provide the, the ideal team. There's nothing wrong with a family member or a friend or a carer coming into the group as well, okay? I'll just very, very quickly go over this because there's lots and lots of literature on the, the websites about the, the uh, dementia today. My own personal view with no research whatsoever that the figure is way, way, way in excess of that. A lot of people are struggling. Um, some are in denial, but I think it's a, a massive problem. It's a national priority for, for certainly for Scotland, and I'm sure it is in the rest of the UK. And two other phenomena have appeared, which early onset and young onset dementia, these are younger people who are developing the symptoms of dementia. And what it means for us is that the images we're using um, are not really to be the images of the 1940s or 50s or 60s, that we need to bring the materials right up to the 80s, 90s, and even the 2000s. Um, so that, that's a big task and, and we'll need to uh, address that soon, okay? So somebody um, in Alzheimer's gave me this thing. He said, what you need to know if you're a volunteer, you don't need to know lots and lots and lots. These are the, the five key things that you need to know. And I'm sure all of us have had some experience of knowing somebody who's been living with dementia. And that is the key word, living with dementia. Although it's a, a, a terminal illness, there is no cure, people can still live well with dementia. And the support and help is available from your, your local Alzheimer's associations. I just put this one up and I'm not gonna to talk too much about it because it's quite uh, emotional for me. This was a rugby team I played with and yesterday, Friday, Wednesday, we were at the funeral of one of the guys who died with, uh, from dementia. And he had been one of our first volunteers in rugby memories. He had an encyclopedic memory of sport. He was a great guy. But if the average is one out of 14 uh, have dementia, two of the guys in that picture have died as a result of the dementia. And that's when it really hits home. People that you knew and you realize how much they loved their sport, they loved their games and the stories they had and they're no longer with us, okay? So very quickly, it started off as football memories, okay, Hugh? And this was how it started. An old guy was very reluctant in the group to speak, and he just hid behind his newspaper, and his friend had told me that Willie, as he called him, Willie had been a good player in his day. And he hadn't half been a good player in his day because a shy, retiring old guy had played international football at Wembley. Hugh, can you click that bottom left of the other half? It takes a wee while to come in. Oh, this one here, yeah. That's, yeah. Soccer forces of England and Scotland take the field at Wembley. While Mr. Maisky tries to peer around the Battle of Stalingrad and watch this bloodless encounter between sporting Britishers. Scotland kicks off after losing the toss and starts the attack with the Waddle and Walker wing combination. Had it not been for, hello, that's a roundabout way of getting places. Had it not been for Cullis at centre half with Mercer and Hepgood supporting, Scotland might have, I'll say we look after our footballers, Scotland might have got away with the match. Although at times, goalie Dawson had to put in some nice work. Anyway, after 90 minutes of battle, there was no score. Just stalemate on the soccer front. Okay, that's fine. So, well, Bill had played in that game, and because it was wartime, he had no international cap or honours. But he could recall that game, the weather, the players, every single thing about it, even though by that stage his dementia was quite advanced. So I would say without any hesitation, 
that as far as that old guy was concerned, reminiscence through sport was far more effective than any medication he was on, okay? As I wish we could have invented this slogan and Nike hadn't pinched it before us. So th these are all the things I think that we can say reminiscence through sport can do. And it is very much like looking at a remote control for your television. You pause where they are then, you rewind to the sporting past and you press play. Never mind what they've forgotten, concentrate on what is still there. And what is still there is a very powerful recall of distant memory, certainly relating to the sports they were involved with, okay? So the second so over part- Over to you, Dan. Sorry, the, the second part of the, the document will be drawing on, on some of the issues Michael spoke about there, the language to be used, for example, the settings and the routines we've found uh, through experience are really important. The importance of routine and timing and knowing where people are and when they have to be in, in places. Images is key because we, we've discovered through uh, COVID, uh, our changing experience of COVID was that while Zoom may have been the answer to um, virtually everybody's um, working practices and ha has changed our, all our lives dramatically, we found there are huge practical issues uh, in dealing with care homes through Zoom in terms of the provision. Do they have, do, do everybody, does everyone in the care home have access to a screen? Well, we found out very quickly they don't because when they're isolated in, in their own rooms, they have to have individual provision, which then brings you into the tap provision of tablets and laptops and how, how do people use them? Can they use them? are moving, Im moving images are not, we found very quickly, that effective. So Michael touched on that. So we'll be embracing all of that in the document with recommendations about how and when uh, the various mediums can be used. And, and, and we've just found that the individual approach is very, obviously it's key in terms of isolation, but um, our challenge is um, to deliver our services when people are in isolation, and that hopefully will change very quickly. So time frames are very important. Preparation and checklists are all very important. That there are rules and regulations um, which groups need to have for their own operation, just how a group is managed. We've detailed all of that, how, how business needs to be conducted, governance, although it might be a pain and in whatever part of your body it is a necessary evil in terms of even funding, how you secure the funding. So we've gone through all these processes and tried to pair them back into the simplest possible form and offering some advice on how to, to proceed. Evaluation and research are very important going forward. What works and what doesn't work? We've established what's, a, uh, what's working in our various fields. It might not work in everybody's fields. I mentioned partly because of geography or legal aspects, but also because of the, the very basic differences between sports. So it's very important to find out what has worked in different places. Can you apply it? Can you be flexible uh, in your practices? And we've tried to reflect that need for flexibility in the document as well. And it's always very useful, Michael uh, mentioned the, the um, importance of professional help. Well, part of the professional help is usually to be found in a university project near at hand. We are very fortunate in, in our sense in that there are various universities in Scotland, particularly Stirling, uh, which, which we've worked with. They have a dementia unit there, which will produce bespoke training videos, for example, sometimes there's a cost, sometimes there isn't, they're funded projects. So to establish a link with a local university, which is working on research projects, you very often find that they will be happy to attach themselves to your project because they can use uh, your activity as part of their research analysis. And we've summarized various things and we've done an and finally uh, information page and where you can get more information, websites and so on. So that's the structure. Now to go back to our own, um, case in Badnach and it, it, it's bit you know Shinti for those of you who don't know is very important in the community and the importance we draw our inspiration from these two characters really uh, one is uh, on the left here is John Mackenzie is our ambassador and he's chair of the Badnach project 
and the, ir the irony or the fact of this matter is that in, in this particular cup final, the character on his right, Tommy Nicholson, who was a great rival and became a great friend, was sadly to, to die uh, having lived with dementia for, for many years. So John has first-hand experience. And one of the other important things we found in our group is to involve people who are living with dementia in the working practices of the group. We have one individual on our group in, in Badna who's been living with dementia for some time and has been progressively uh, changing in terms of his capabilities. So it's been a useful exercise for that person to be involved, but even more so for us to see and hear his views on what we're doing. So if people can be involved, it has to be treated with great care, but if they can be involved, it's very, very important. So there, there are the two individuals actually doing what, what they do best. They used to hit each other frequently when they were actively sporting, uh, but now they're the best of friends and they have um, worked together filling our memory boxes, which we give out to care homes or to individuals. We have bigger and smaller versions of them and we fill them with all sorts of things like um, yearbooks applying to the sport and you can put all sorts of things like balls or referees whistles i'm sure some of you are very familiar with the, the concept but uh, you can see in the reaction on, on donnie's face here on the right the kind of enjoyment he gets out of being part of the overall system it's very important also communication is key and it's very important that that groups establish relationships with the media whether that particularly at a local level and this again will vary in different areas as to what kind of local newspapers you have because at the end of the day while technology has made great strides and we make use of usb uh, memory uh, sticks and all the rest of it at the end of the day some people still like to tangle with a big newspaper that they can grapple with and, and read and it's a very still a very meaningful um, way of communicating uh, to the wider world what you're about what you're doing uh, we actively involve uh, intergenerational aspects of our work uh, in bad enough and this is a group which involves a number of people you see donnie here again uh, in the in the middle of it all we have young people we have uh, all sorts of ages and, and family uh, units in this picture and, and some other key members of our committee, former players uh, involved on that particular day at a children's tournament, which was an ideal way of involving the whole family from young players, for example, to fathers, mothers, grandfathers, and sometimes even, even older than that. And, and we had on hand displays of materials, strips, the usual stuff to talk about. And a lot of it is disposable. Um, we point out in the manual as well that you have to produce resources which are cost effective. In other words, if somebody spills a cup of coffee over a set of cards, it doesn't matter because you can rattle off another one very quickly. But you do want to be involving some things like piles of books or important historical artifacts where, where there is a danger, you'll just lose them because there should be, the mat ideal materials are things that people can pick up and take away and nobody's bothered. So there's all sorts of uh, help and, uh, and advice there. We've, I'm not gonna go through all these um, items here because they're in the manual, but it, it's a case. So we're going to, to allow Fran to distribute this presentation so you can go through them more at leisure, but we've, we've got a whole list there of planned activities, two sets of planned activities just to to give you ideas of how to structure the groups. Uh, and obviously there will be gaps there. And one of them, the last one there was a Shinty one, which you can stage a veterans match and it quite incredibly, um, you, you can use that as, as a, either as an activity of itself to engage with people and watch the play and to have the crowd and so on, but also as a fundraiser, we had that match I think it was actually, we had one, this was a planned one in 2019, which didn't happen. We had one in 2015 on a Saturday evening in a beautiful setting in the middle of summer, which raised something like, I think in excess of 2000 pounds, which was contributed to Alzheimer's Scotland at the time. So there are all sorts of um, add-ons that you can have to your activities. So the, the summary really is, there's no one way to run a Shinty Memories group or any other group, because each one has to develop its own identity and style depending on the circumstances. The membership will vary. 
but the core aspects are still the same to make life, uh, people's lives better uh, and easier, not just the people living with it uh, as individuals, but their carers, their husbands, their spouses, whatever. And, and this intergenerational aspect, Michael mentioned, increasingly younger people are becoming involved with dementia itself, but also younger people need to understand why grandfather or grandmother why they are the way they are and why they can't do certain things. And we found engagement with schools is, is hugely important. And we're developing a, re a really good relationship with our local high school, for example, where this work is being built into their curriculum. Now, that will obviously be different in different areas of the country, the possibilities. But under what's called the Curriculum for Excellence in Scotland, we've got an opportunity to do that. And we're developing, for example, in, in Shinty terms, we've got a national network now, which is very important. And all the networks of memory groups in Scotland are feeding into Sporting Heritage UK. And we think that's a very important and, and very supportive move to enable us to progress. Simple communication is very important, both for care home staff and, and carers. We produced uh, sets of leaflets, which just basically uh, tell people what we do and where to come most importantly of all where to contact uh, lo people locally if you feel you need help so i mentioned evaluation again that there are various bits of evaluation there's a kind of formal and there's an informal aspect to that particularly if you're involved in funded uh, projects because people need to know what they spent their money on uh, and um whether it was any good or not, whether it worked or not. So you need to be savvy uh, about that because if you're depending on, on repeating or, or getting extensions to funding, they want to prove that it's worked. So it's a necessary evil, if I can put it that way. And sometimes it's very laborious and time consuming, but it helps if you've got somebody on your group or on your committee who's either interested or good at filling forms in. I mentioned earlier uh, the recent success we had with one individual. Um, this was in a, a separate uh, group from our, our Badenoch group, but uh, this individual had been basically uh, speechless and without much communication, had in fact been a, a difficult patient, uh, was the way he was described to me. And I have permission to, to discuss his case from his, his carers in the care home. But what a remarkable transformation happened just about two weeks ago when um, we got a local player to go in and to cut a stick down to a, a respectable size so that there would be no damage done if the individual started swinging it about. And lo and behold, if you look at, there's two things about this picture above all that, that struck me when I saw it. The level of concentration on this fellow's eyes and, and his the way he's looking at what he's doing. There is a ball down in the corner here, a soft ball, not, not a real ball, so a soft ball so that no damage is done. He's clearly supervised. The man can barely walk. He needs support. Um, and he hadn't been walking or keen to get up until this happened, until he was given the stick. His hands, the other part of it, his hands are perfectly positioned for holding a shinty stick. Now, this is somebody who was having difficulty feeding himself and, and doing manual, simple manual text um, um, activity was beyond him. But when the stick appeared, perfect position of his hands, the concentration, looking at the ball, not looking anywhere else. So he happily spent a, a period of time and now was on a daily basis does this in the corridors and in the room under supervised conditions. And clearly that is an issue which we stress safety has to be paramount. And if you're involving somebody in swinging a stick in the ball, uh, you have to be careful. And golf, there are opportunities outside post COVID which could be developed. But the success of that was really uh, fantastic. And uh, since then, I've now heard that he started whistling, uh, which he just wasn't doing. Uh, and uh, when the care home manager S asked me what, what relevance did I think that had, uh, I suspect it's a simple thing of the, the referee's whistle during play. So they've now acquired a referee's whistle, which is causing mayhem in the care home, as you can imagine, but it has to be supervised as well. But as an, as an example of the impact and success, and I'm not 
for a minute suggesting this will work for everyone. But what we will show in the handbook is that if you get to this stage and as Michael's 90, whatever it was, golfer, um, we shouldn't forget the physical aspect either. Things like this are, are remarkable, and simple images we spoke about. An image like this can provide a talking point for many, many hours uh, around a table and they can be passed around. It's just put in uh, for a bit of a joke. I mentioned intergenerational work. You might have spotted this guy in, in the bed. And this is an example of what we do. These kids, there is now that vacant seat could be occupied by a little sister who has appeared since we took this picture. But there is through this family and they are both uh, this fellow's wife uh, and her father, a whole range of memory which is being applied in that particular part of our King Yusi and King Craig group because uh, all these guys now understand why certain things are happening in their community. And that symbolizes that. And we'll get a picture taken where the wee one is in there eventually. So a bit back to the physical. Uh, part of it, venues are very important, and you see from this uh, some great work being done in, in Carnoustie, in, in the Gulf, um, if you take people to venues, obviously there are practical issues there, um, but the, the, the way the, the groups work and what you can achieve is fantastic. So I think, Michael, do you want to go through this and take us to the finish? We're just a bit there, and I suspect more of this will be useful in terms of the Q&A, so if we can just rattle through the rest of it. Yeah, I think the the strongest memories people seem to have are school days, teenage years and, and early adulthood. And I think it's a question of finding which trigger actually um, opens their memory box. You got the next one there? Yeah. And that, there's an example we had earlier about uh, Lynn and her dad. Look at the joy on the old guy's face there um, when he recognises people. And he had very limited speech. And okay, next one. And then down in Hoyk, this is the rugby memories group. Nice to see a, a gender balance there. And again, activities for absolutely everybody. The minute they get the rugby ball in their hand, they've just lots and lots of fun. Okay. And this was a visiting professor who came over to see us. Um, and he could not believe how many memory groups we had. And he had been battering his head off a brick wall back in the States. He sadly passed away a couple of years ago, but it's good to know that his work has not been in vain because there are now baseball memory groups uh, stretching all across America. And they are, they are doing great work through the Society of Baseball Researchers. And Michael always, he was a great guy. But the thing that really struck with me was this about uh, cure and care. He said, in America, a lot of people tended to be and say, well, we won't make this a priority because it's a terminal illness. And he said, well, while people are alive, we should care. And I think that, that has kind of stuck with me for a long time. Okay. So just in summary then to conclude we we are aware that groups will have to adapt and what we're trying to do in the document is to offer solutions on a wide range of activity we can't possibly cover anything but the document will be issued in a pdf format so it can be and we hope it will be updated regularly and also particularly in terms of moving out of the the lockdown period so we are taking all care to try and cover as many of the nuances as we can but we would, uh, our message is clearly, we would like to hear from anyone who can contribute to the updating on an ongoing basis. And if there's anything, any improvements which can be made at this stage, we'll uh, do our best to incorporate that. We can't, uh, with respect, issue the document as it stands to everybody because we'll never get it finished if that was the case. But we, we will choose, and if anyone really wants to have a look at it, they can see and we'll, we'll try even to, to show bits of it. But we are taking great care to get the best possible advice at this stage. Uh, <clears throat> and um, there's the contacts. Anyone who wants to approach either of us can do so. You're quite welcome to do that. And as I say, Fran will post this or distribute it. But we're quite happy now to take any questions you may have on anything we've said or not said or that you would like to suggest, feel free. Just check if, if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. 
<clears throat> always work. So just checking first. <laughs> you said something earlier on. I think it was in Michael's bit about having a professional on the group. Who would you suggest is kind of a best or a good fit to be that professional? I, well, I think, sorry. Yeah. On you go, Michael, first. Yeah. yeah. I think somebody from your local Alzheimer's group um, or somebody from a, a charity involved with, with dementia, because when people volunteer, some of them are a wee bit scared um, of, of dealing with behaviours or distracting behaviour. And it's great to have the professionals there. I mean, sparing his blushes, Kenny's there. Uh, I've been along at Kenny's group in Inverness and I knew that absolutely anything relating to the, the illness itself, Kenny was the guy to deal with it. I was just there to do the football bit. And that, that's most reassuring. Yeah, no, that's good. Advice. Yeah, I think if I can add to that, uh, just a couple of things that, that sometimes this is a plain sight thing. The obvious person is, is just too obvious to ask. But uh, certainly a medic, if, if you have a, and most clubs, most sporting clubs nowadays at any kind of reasonable level have some sort of medical input. And, and we have one group where a GP is quite happy to sit on the group as a, a kind of loose cannon advisor answering questions, day-to-day -day questions. But, but more importantly, these <laughs> medics can deliver messages. And I always remember this guy uh, saying at one of our early groups in Le Haber where there were a lot of skeptics around, you know, what are we going to do? Is it any use? And he, he just bluntly said, uh, cut through all the, the medical stuff and he said you guys can do more good for my patients in an hour in these sessions than I can do stuffing them full of pills now he was you know he was paraphrasing obviously but you know he cut to the chase but it was important that a doctor said that I'll spare uh, one of our own members in Badenoff's blushes it's always useful to have people who know the community and very few people know the community better than um, ministers or whatever locally because they just know people and yeah. they know where there might be somebody who's struggling but not saying so and they can advise without breaching confidentiality or anything like that but we are very lucky to have that input. The other one I would I would strongly advise is to make contact with heritage professionals. Now they can come in all sorts of roles whether they work in libraries or archives, whatever, sometimes it's different. We are lucky we've got an attachment to what's called the Folk Museum, which is all the paraphernalia, the sticks, the balls, the curling stones, but primarily has expert in preserving documents and producing documents. So if you, and it gives you an institutional support, you know, as even a venue that you can, and it, most sports clubs have got how, clubhouses. So yep. make an attachment with a local not just the professional, Michael's got experience of working with, you know, like St. Johnson Football Club. Most of our Premier League, Scottish Premier League football clubs have now got a commitment to living with dementia, which is useful. It's different levels, there's different answers, but these key people can help you enormously. That's great. Thanks, Jim Dan. So from looking at uh, having heard what's being included in uh, the manual, is there anything um, that anybody would like to add? Is there anything that you're doing, anybody doing in their own practice at the moment that they think they would like to add in as an example? I know we've had a couple of examples from Chris and from Liz about uh, different sort of games that might be possible. Yeah. Um, Hugh, I'm not sure there's the scope to add those in, but has anybody got any other suggestions they would like to add at this, this stage? Yeah, I'm happy to share um, some thoughts from work that we're doing here in Ipswich, and Liz may well want to add to this because she's actually more the dementia specialist than I am. Um, we're actively involved in a couple of sporting memories groups. We run one of their multi-sport groups. Um, they, I would say that the people that come along, um, it, they're clearly not only dementia. We've had people, we have people who are living with dementia. We have people with many other uh, problems as well, physical disabilities, and certainly people with sometimes hidden mental disabilities that we've learned about them over the years. One chap who said to us, this is the only place that I can come and I can be the kind of person that I wish I was. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody who lives with crippling anxiety. Yeah. But of course, struggling with loneliness. Yeah. Loneliness and depression, as we know, very, very closely linked. Um, um, dementia often misdiagnosed as depression and vice versa. Uh, these sessions really help 
people's overall mental health, whatever position they're in. Somebody who is a long way through their dementia journey, somebody who maybe doesn't even know they're at the beginning of it or all the other bits and pieces, <clears throat> all the other afflictions and so on that we have. Liz, um, probably try and bring you in. I think you said to me once from one of your dementia specialist sessions, someone said, if you can deal with people who are living with dementia, you can deal with any elderly people. Was that roughly what they said? Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, if you can work with people that are living with dementia, then you can expand that to, as Tim has mentioned, people who are feeling lonely, isolated, and you, you can use exactly the same techniques in terms of sporting memories and, and getting people together to talk. Yeah, to talk about yeah. These are very good points, absolutely excellent points, and maybe ask Kenny to say something about this, but we did have a, 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 an experience we had to work through uh, and, and now we always refer to our groups now as, as dealing with dementia, loneliness, depression, and we add a whole list and other mental issues, any, you know, because we found initially um, there was, um, the only way I can put this is th there was something of a stigma attached to dementia labeling, uh, which was very important. We had to break it down in that some people were through lack of knowledge or whatever, uh, just not willing to go to groups because everybody had dementia. It's almost like the, and I don't wish this to be flippant, like the argument about AIDS, you can catch AIDS off somebody if you shake their hands, that kind of lack of understanding. And what we're trying to do with the, the, the handbook is trying to break down these uh, cliches, if you want, and, and widen it, because particularly in COVID period now, we've got so many different challenges but they're actually not that different at all. It's all the loneliness, the depression. So I don't know if Kenny can advise on, on just more in a wee bit more detail about how you break down that uh, kind of, it's not partly fear, Kenny, I don't know if I'm going too far with that, but lack of understanding of what is that issue here. I, I think everything you've just said there, Hugh Dan, hits the nail on the head. Um, I suppose um, I would suggest that the, the Perhaps the best term to use is that you're setting up a dementia-friendly group. Yeah. Yeah. And I think community groups have the ability to be as flexible as they want to be about who comes along to the group. Um, I work for Alzheimer's Scotland, so we're funded specifically to work with people who have dementia. So my experience has always been of running groups that are specifically for people with dementia. But if you are running a community group, then if that's set up so it's dementia friendly, then hopefully you do two things. Firstly, you break down some of the stigma that Hugh Dan's just described, and you can just encompass a whole lot more people that may benefit from it. And I think, um, as Hugh Dan's just said, the COVID situation has just changed this completely. So there's now a whole host more people in the world that if, if we could get one of these groups going tomorrow, there's so many more people could benefit from it. So I suspect post COVID, um, having that very flexible dementia friendly label, if you like, um, tag is probably the way to go. Yeah, without um, over egging the Badenoch group, what we use uh, in a lot of our marketing or information is caring community. You know, that the group is a caring part of a caring community and that, that has actually worked quite well. Because I come in on the Badenoch thing as well, because one of the things that, we, I, I'm the blushing minister, by the way, um, <laughs> uh, one of the things we found, that, well, I found with one or two people who were reluctant, because, because people who are getting older are afraid of getting dementia, and so they didn't want to come near it in case people thought they had it, and they didn't, they, didn't, they, didn't, they, might, they might do, I don't know, um, but just to say, but you could be a help, Yeah. you know, yeah. To, to, yeah. so invite people to come along and let them think, let them be. People yeah. who, are, who are going to be a help and not just a client. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's part of the openness, I mean, and transparency and in, in that people will understand then and see what's happening. And we have found that our, our numbers grew. I think I'm fair, that's fair to say, Catherine, that, um, you know, we started with very small numbers, but as the noise and, and the mood music got out, that this is what it was, and quizzes and, and the joining <laughs> up of sports, we joined curling, shinty, and golf for some uh, social events when they were possible. And that almost, very often there's a crossover, but it almost tripled the audience. 
uh, and triples the impact. Yeah, can I share something there about the the way you present the, the groups? We had a, a group, and this is no disrespect to Alzheimer's Scotland, Kenny. We had a group somewhere, a golf memories group, and the poster was very professional, but the giant logo was Alzheimer's Scotland. And a lot of people who were in denial wouldn't go near it. But when you transfer it to the big logo being the cricket club or the football club or whatever, and then down the bottom, dementia friendly, supported by Alzheimer's, whatever, massive difference. And it's back to what I was saying about the community of interest. If, if all you're doing is meeting other people who have dementia, you're not really in the real world. But if you're in there with people who are maybe living with other illnesses or are perfectly healthy, that's the real world. And we've been at groups where you couldn't tell who the person living with dementia was because the thing that joined them together was their love or their passion for the sport or the club. And the gender balance, it, it, some, we mentioned that before, but the gender balance is very important too, that we don't just have groups of 12 men talking about a football match because if a woman was to appear at the door and see that first thing she's going to do is probably turn around and walk out so you know if there is a mix it's undoubtedly more effective um, and and more inclusive obviously but um, i think it's something to which can easily slip through un, unknown you know, or unrecognized And would you have any recommendations, sorry, jumping in, would you have any recommendations about how to encourage women to attend a session for a sport that might be traditionally seen as a, a male preserve view? Well, at, at the end of the day, I, I think the best means of communication is one to one. And this is where people like, you know, Catherine comes in, people who know the community and who know the individual circumstances of families very often the children might be a way around it, you know, to get granny to go as well as grandpa or granny who may be living on her own. Yeah. Uh, why don't you come granny? You know, kids are very persuasive when they, when they yeah. think about things. A, a good example of that is the Hoyt Rugby Memories Group. There are more women than men at the Hoyt Rugby Memories Group because they have memories. They, they, they didn't have women's rugby noses, but their memories was going <clears> to watch the games and they can share, you know, how their children were, where they are now. And the, the, the buzz and the excitement is tremendous. And I think they, they get about 60 odd people along to their meetings, of which definitely 35 are, are, are female. There's, a, there's an interesting suggestion in the chat room that a care home Olympics should be set up. <laughs> we can't even get ordinary Olympics. No, but I, that a, might care, be yeah. a care home Olympics is eminently possible under these conditions yeah. where you decide what you're going to do. You do it on Zoom, you do it online, you compare things and the fun. I mean, I've noticed in the chat room, people are talking about variations of virtually all the sports and they are all possible. Mm -hmm. Just in an online format, obviously my, my experience of reminiscence over the last year or so has been with the Yorkshire Cricket Foundation. We've set up two online groups via Zoom, one on a Tuesday morning at 11 and one on a Thursday at 2. And we've supplemented those with special events so that people of, you know, all ages, abilities, thoughts, interests can, can attend. And it's, it's been quite successful. But I think that the challenge with it all is, one, um, getting people there in an online format. Uh, the challenges of using Zoom, having a computer, knowing how to work it, awareness. Uh, but also now the sessions are getting, we regularly get kind of 10, 15 people in our Zoom sessions. I think on Zoom, that's kind of enough. And if you yeah. more people, yeah. you need to set up another group because yeah. it's not reminiscent, it becomes a webinar, doesn't it, rather than yeah. reminiscent. I think the one thing you do notice about the world of Zoom, when the people that you did have in your groups in, in normal times come on, is the deterioration in their expression and mood, everything about them, you think, gosh, that is not the same guy from a couple of months ago. 
And you, I, and again, something that you shouldn't rule out, and I, I'm guilty of this. There's a couple of groups I was doing on Zoom where the person living with dementia seemed to be distracted or was moving about, and all the interest was coming from the carer or the family member. And somebody said to me, don't you know, discount that, because for the carers, it's a, an, a fantastic break, and they're back being themselves. So I, I, that's what I learned a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. yeah the, the relationship with care home staff is obviously crucial and, and will vary from institution or, or building to building, even from shift to shift. Uh, the current situation is clearly that, that care home staff are, are on their knees, and I, I don't mean that disrespectfully. They're, they're under enormous pressure, so adding other things for them to do is sometimes difficult. Yeah. But, but the, 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 other, the other end of it, when we are in socially shows less socially distanced circumstances is that the the two hours that we provide in these sessions for it say it goes that long is is time off or time for them to do something else and and similarly for spouses in family circumstances for somebody who may be a full-time carer if the individual living with dementia is then released from that circumstance for two hours well the other person in the, in the household can go and do a number of things. Uh, so there is a, a, an element of relief for that. So it's, it's, it's just adapting to each individual situation, which is a challenge in itself. Mm -hmm. we're, we're just approaching our final few minutes of the session. So are there any um, sort of final comments or questions for Hugh or Michael? Or does anybody want to share anything from their practice? And Hugh, were you saying that you, would you like to share a copy of the manual or you, would you rather take comments from well, people? Yeah, I think just in the sheer practicalities of it, Fran, I know mm -hmm. Kenny is having a look at it with a colleague so that, mm -hmm. that you know, we are, we are showing it to people with specific, and I'm not being disrespectful to anyone here, um, people with specific interests and expertise, we are drawing on that and, and I include the Sterling Dementia Group. So these are high level, if you want, um, working practice issues and so on, uh, but we're quite happy. I think the, the PowerPoint will guide people into most of it, because if we do issue it super widely, Fran, we'll just never get through it. Mm, I know, <laughs> but, I know, you can't design things by committee, so, I understand. So yeah. Michael and I would prefer that the document gets to A1 shape, gets issued and then gets tweaked. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's yes, not a big radical overhaul by the time we're through it, I don't think. No. No, Michael, you wanted to say. Yeah, just, just a quick one, given that we've got two people from Ipswich Town here um, about the power of reminiscence. I, I was doing a group um, and the men were all, it was all men, they were all around the table and there was one guy sitting outside of the circle and I asked the, the care home person, why, why is this guy not joining in? Oh, he can't speak English. So I said, well, ask him to come over anyway. So we're passing around different pictures. And one of them was the kickoff of the England-Hungary game when Billy Wright is shaking hands with Fernish Bushkas. And the guy who, quote, couldn't speak English, picked it up, looked at it, and he said to me, Pushkas, fat, slow, one-footed, and brilliant. <laughs> and we got talking and he had escaped from Hungary when the Russians invaded, and guess where he landed? Ipswich. So this was too good a chance to miss. So I said, I know a player who went from my club to Ipswich, uh, Dougie Moran. And he said, ah, Dougie Moran. And he started rattling off all, all the Ipswich team that he'd seen. <laughs> so there, yeah, that was a guy who couldn't speak English, but football was the trigger, and he never looked back after that. Uh, just, just two very swift points, Fran. I mean, th th there's an issue there that's been identified. The whole language thing, the whole cultural thing about, for example, cricket would be a very good example. There are whole communities who will feel excluded from the process unless they're brought into it purely and simply on linguistic grounds. So we, uh, up, you know, in the Highlands, um, in some of our groups, for example, we are producing materials in, in Scottish Gaelic because very often what happens in, in dementia in these cases, people revert to their first language. Yes. And if it happens to be Scottish Gaelic, 
well, you know, the doctors and whoever are going, the carers are going to have trouble. Now, we're lucky we've got nurses and doctors. So that is an issue in particular geographical and, and particularly some urban communities in England, uh, Michael. And one last one, if you've got nice images, see an image of, of a group locally, that'd be nice just to have a bit of variety in the activities for inclusion. Just send me a JPEG or something. And just a, a quick PS following on from the, the, the language thing. It also people who are blind or deaf yeah. that we need to give a wee think about how we include them in groups. Yes, yeah, so it sounds like just to, to pick up on that, that final comment and to um, draw the session to an end, it sounds like, as you say, the, the document will be produced and almost straight away we're going to be looking at you yeah. know, development. So it's very much a work in progress. Yeah. So I uh, just remains for me to thank everybody for their time this morning and particularly for Hugh and Michael for presenting about the manual. I'll share their presentation. Now I know you're on quite a tight time frame. So if anybody would like to make comments, when do you need any comments and suggestions back to you, Hugh? Four o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> time for a quick cup of tea. <laughs> next week. Next week. So um, if we say by next Friday. Yeah, otherwise yeah. we'll have your chief executive jumping up and down on us. Okay, okay. Um, so I'll put that in the wrap up. So if anybody would like to make comments or follow up with Michael and Hugh, um, you've got a week to, to let the, your thoughts percolate and to communicate them back. So yes, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Hugh, for presenting. And thank you everybody for their time today. I will circulate the presentation and a link to the recording. And as, um, as Hugh, I can't remember if it was Hugh or Michael said, the importance of evaluation, there'll be an evaluation link for this session. So um, I'd be incredibly grateful if you can complete that, because that helps us plan our future training for Sporty Heritage. So it just remains for me to say, have a, a great rest of your day and a great weekend. Thank you, everybody. Bye, folks. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.